Hello. Today I'm going to introduce a nice young man by the name of Sam. He's going to be talking about his epileptic and dyslexic. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Sam. Chiti, thanks very much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you about a very important subject about how we coped, or I cope, with epilepsy and dyslexia. Okay, so first of all, I would like to ask you, um, can you remember um, when you were first diagnosed with epilepsy and dyslexia? Well, understanding that it's, in my day, they didn't talk very much about epilepsy. It was a taboo subject. People that had epilepsy were often keeping it in the background. And the same with dyslexia. In my day, they didn't even know dyslexia existed. GD. Um, yeah, that must have been very difficult for you to Well, that's that's a very critical time in our lives when we go to school. Now, uh, we were just labelled, mislabeled. You're just lazy. You can't. You, my reading skills were not up to par, and I couldn't spell very well. And also, when I was reading, I sometimes put words in that weren't even on the page because my mind was in a different place, and I had to guess what the words were. And of course, it was very sad to be a young young person at school, say five, six, seven, and being left behind and being called lazy and stupid, not just by teachers, but I might even say by my parents who didn't understand, why can't you spell this? We've been going over these words for five minutes. Why can't you spell, say, a word like because I just couldn't see it. I had word blindness. And so, uh, as a five-year-old, or a six-year-old, mm -hmm. how did it affect you? Well, it made me feel very shameful. I felt ridiculed by my teachers and also by my parents. And it makes you feel very insecure. And it even makes you feel it's my fault. And then you get angry even with yourself because other kids can do it and you can't do it. When I was sitting in class, sometimes I would have a petite mal. I would just blank out. I would be sitting there and the teacher would say, hey, pay attention. And I was I was in the middle of almost like a little trance where I just drifted off inside. It may only have been for two or three minutes, but that was put down to me not paying attention, not me having a disability. Um, so, um, as you got older, um, was there anyone that you could talk to? Like, did you have mm -hmm. any friends or any mm -hmm. relatives or any close or work that you could rely on? Actually, I think my saviour was a uh, a, a primary school teacher called Rose Pollock and Rose saw that I had potential that I couldn't really spell but I had a higher IQ than some of the other people but it took me longer longer to assimilate the material that was put in front of me and she gave me a, a power of encouragement that saved me Mm. 
That's a very good question. I can say now that uh, a few years ago I was living in Switzerland and my partner had a, a small girl, 12, and she was dyslexic and she had real problems reading. And I said to my partner who went to the school, spoke to the teachers, and even in a quite an enlightened society like Switzerland, this part of Switzerland, Ticino, they says, we, d we don't recognize dyslexia. We, th there isn't anybody in this part of Switzerland with dyslexia. And that was maybe, maybe that was five years ago. And with all the evidence and all the medical research and psychology behind it, they're still very reticent to say some people need an intervention. They need different skill sets to help them overcome their disabilities. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. And, but I still think that there needs to be more awareness. I still think that at least it's once every month there needs to be some kind of inclusion day. And I think that, again, it needs to, primarily, I think it needs to start in school. But I also think, you know, it does need to start from home as well. Yes, the two parts, it's got to top to bottom and from grassroots up. It, it, it's, it's certainly, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying there. Yes. Um, because of the natures of my jobs and jobs that I've done in the past, yeah. if I had declared that I was epileptic or I had I had dyslexia and had a problem with learning things and words and spelling things, I w truly believe I would have had no career whatsoever. So I had to keep it hidden. I mean, that's, I mean, just hearing Yes, uh, it, it's true, and and it's it's also true to this very day. We like to think society is very enlightened, and I am I am of the opinion that it may be on the surface, but there is a lot still remaining to be done. So, in so that has become um, subject to humanity question. If you know, if if you had the power, or if you had such a control mm -hmm. to, you know, make a difference in terms of disability, whatever it is, um, how how would you? Well, I, I will say one thing that uh, if I was impacting on this, and I do try and impact on people, um, I use alternative methods. 
I don't really necessarily think that mainstream is wrong, but they haven't got the whole grasp. So my intuitive way of doing it is to, re to reduce people's stress levels because there is no condition that the human being has that will not improve if the psychological stressors within the being is reduced. That may be just teaching acceptance, teaching some sort of energy work so as that you can become more balanced in your body. That, I think, has not been funded properly uh, and they haven't really mainstream media, mainstream medicine and science is very reticent to go into this field and say, what really works with people? I, I, I can give you one research. Uh, a lady I know, she was very epileptic. This was a few years ago, 15 years ago, and she got access to horse riding. And when this lady was on the horse, she never had a seizure. The connection between this girl being happy around horses and being on the horse affected her that she didn't have seizures and somehow, and I don't know how, this made it much more beneficial for this woman and she had a horse most of her life and it had a big impact and that's just one species affecting another species. No, I, I totally agree because uh, someone that I used to work with uh -huh. for dyslexia yes. mm -hmm. and she used to only comply. Yes. Yes. And riding a horse that had dyslexia has completely non existent. Yes. And yeah, so um I I mean yeah, I, I do think I agree with what you're saying, I do believe that there needs to be some sort of natural magic. And yeah. I and I also think as well that like all the medicine I I understand what you're saying. They they suppress the symptoms, yes. but they do not get to the cause. That's why I promote in my way of working at it, methods that are working and fixing the causes, rebalancing the energies in the body, yeah. where be it Chinese medicine, meditation, yeah. horse riding. Yeah. Today we were out in nature. Yeah. We went to nature, we went to a beautiful spot beside a beautiful big river, sunshine, walked around a little, and I think you even said yourself, it makes you calmer yeah. and it has a beneficial effect. Anything that takes the stressors off of us, has got a big effect on our health. Well, thank you very, very, very much for answering my questions. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, interviewing you. And, yeah, thank you. You're welcome, Chibi. Bye. Thank you.